day, I'm Jeff Cook with University of Georgia Cooperative Extension in Taylor and Peach County, and this is Backyard Basics. Well, it's the middle of June, and for this month's episode, because it's so hot, I thought we'd better do something inside. So we're gonna focus on canning jams and jellies. Nah, I'm just kidding. I started thinking about it today, and I thought, well, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in my garden. It's kind of in full swing. It's a little bit late this year because of the cool spring, but it's, everything's kind of in full swing. And I know some of the things probably going on in my garden or the same things going on in your garden. So I thought, well, we'll just come to the garden. We'll walk around. We'll look at some different things. We'll touch on a few things going on and uh, talk about this. Maybe it'll answer a few of your, your questions that you have going on in your garden. So let me put these cans of jar, jams and jellies away, and uh, we'll, get to, we'll get to looking at the garden. All right, the first thing I want to talk on is not about a specific crop, but hopefully you can see to my left. You're right. This uh, pumpkin plant, you can tell hopefully that it's wilted, okay? And then hopefully you can see the rest of my garden or the rest of parts of my garden. You got some peas here, some southern peas. Um, they're in the same spot, they're not wilting. Um, you can look behind me and around. There's sweet corn, it's not wilting. So what do you think I'm gonna talk about real quick? It started to dry off and it's always dry here in Red Bone, so I call it the Red Bone Desert. So I'm gonna touch on irrigation real quick. On the way up here today, I saw two or three people irrigating, and I thought, you know, this is a perfect topic. Um, and they were all irrigating with sprinklers, you know, above ground sprinklers, just whirly bird type sprinklers. Um, just wanted to touch on it. I know that's what a lot of folks have, but I know also that they're, they're very inefficient. So I was going to touch on the irrigation that I have here and talk about it. it's not very expensive and it's very easy to put in and it's very efficient um, and you use very little water. So what I've got is I've got drip irrigation and it's very simple to use. We did a show on it, but I'm, gonna I'm just gonna talk about the, the, the basic components I have here. I've got some poly tubing, which I've, you, know, you can buy fancy caps for it. All I've got here is a little crimper that crimps it over, bends it over. That keeps all the water, for folk, that wa the water from coming out of it. It's actually turned on right now. So I mean, you can see water's, it's water flowing right now. So from here up the hill, um, as we speak right now, I'm, I'm irrigating this garden. You can't see any water because it's all going right to where the plant needs it. Um, this is drip tape. Right here, this actually connects with some little connectors, which I don't know if you'll be able to see. I've got some I can show you, but we've got little connectors that plug right into the, right into the poly tape, the poly uh, tubing. This connects to that, this connects to that, the, the fitting there. Water flows through this drip tape and actually, there are little emitters right into the drip tape, and this allows a certain amount of water to come out. Uh, it doesn't matter what the pressure is. It regulates the pressure and allows a, only a certain amount of water to come out. And you probably can see, if we can get some of this flipped over, maybe you can see right here through my weeds that this is dripping right here. <clears throat> It'd have been nice to have had a plant here, but I, didn't, I don't have a plant here. But you can see, you can tell by this, how very efficient it is. A lot of times when you plant plants uh, down the row of this, the majority of them are gonna come up at least where you have the, the irrigation. So it's uh, very efficient. I know I've talked to a lot of people who put out soaker hoses. Soaker hoses are probably still more efficient than overhead sprinklers. You know, you think about a day like this, it's 95 degrees. A lot of that water you put out the sprinkler is gonna evaporate. You get a little breeze, a lot of it's gonna blow, you know, off into the woods. This puts water right where you need it. It operates on low pressure. Um, if you're in places like I'm, we're in, we have very, uh, you know, very bad gallons per minute, very bad water flow in our well. Um, I couldn't water this garden efficiently. I used to have sprinklers, two or three sprinklers. I couldn't water it and keep it going like I do now with the sprinklers. So, like I said, very efficient, very easy to do. Um, you know, one roll of the drip tape or, and uh, one roll of the tubing you know, it should last you, if you have a, a, a you know, medium-sized garden, it should last you a few years. Um, just very easy to do. And if you have questions in, in how to put it, to get, put it together, set it up, where to get the pieces and parts, um, you can always call our office in Peach County or Taylor County and we'll answer that question. So now we'll move around with the garden and we'll move into some more specifics. All right, talking about the drip irrigation, this is the fitting I was talking about. Once you have it, you have a tool that you poke a hole in your uh, either 5 eighths or 3 quarter inch your poly tubing, and uh, this just snaps right in. A little nipple right there holds it in place. Then you take your drip tape, 
And the drip tape actually comes with all, there's all kinds of different configurations. Some of it has uh, holes every eight inches, some every 12, but you can buy it different. Some of it has, and it has different flows. So you can get different amount of flow. Um, you can get pressure compensated or not, but you just slide it on there and you screw that in on there right there and that holds it in place. Um, so every year when you get ready to, you know, pile up your garden or you need to do some herring, you can unhook this. Um, you know, leave your main line in the same place and you can just unhook this, take your drip tape, drag it out of the way, do all your tillage operations, and then once you're done, you come back, pop it back in place and pull it on out. Very simple, very efficient. Awesome. All right, we've moved down here to the cucumbers because I was going to show you something, but I also want to say some, one more thing about the drip irrigation, which is what's really nice is, uh, and you probably you might have thought about it or guessed it, is you're only watering in that row. You're not watering in between the row. So all these weeds that come up in the middle of the row, I don't know if you can see some of these weeds. Some of these weeds are actually shriveling up and dying. You know, they got growing when it was raining, but now that it's quit raining, they're not able to get any water. The roots aren't big enough. They're not getting any water. They're not getting any of this irrigation that I'm putting out directly on the row. But what I wanted to touch on real quick with this cucumber is something I did the other day. Down here, you can tell by my left foot, I, uh, I threw out some 3400, some some granular nitrogen, and uh, the leaves were a little bit wet. A little bit of it bounced up on the leaves. These leaves are kind of hairy, kind of rough. It catches a lot of that. So what you can do is you can actually burn, and it happens a lot of times on your cucurbits, like your cucumbers and your squash and your, and your uh, zucchini and things, watermelons, especially these viney crops real big. It's hard to get fertilizer down to the roots and you know, where you want to put it. Um, so a lot of times we were hitting leaves and it's sticking to them. So we get a lot of this foliar burn and anytime you burn a leaf like that, you know, you, you uh, you reduce the efficiency of that plant. Plus you also open it up to some infections and some diseases. But I just wanted to touch on that and, uh, we're going to move over here to the squash. I got a couple things in the squash. I was going to show you cause I think a lot of people are probably seeing the same things in theirs. Right. Now here's a common problem we see in squash in a garden. I was uh, talking to our entomologist in, uh, down in Tifton and asking him because we have a pretty good, pretty substantial planting of uh, squash and zucchini in Taylor County this year about this insect. And he said, oh, we don't usually see it in commercial fields, but the squash vine borer is actually a clear wing moth that you'll see sometimes in the garden. A lot of times you don't see it, but the squash vine borer actually lays eggs at the base of the squash vines and they bore into it. You know, I guess you figured that out from the name, squash vine borer. Anyway, if you have some plants like this that look a little bit unhealthy, a little wilted, you know you're giving them plenty of water, they got plenty of fertilizer, you know what's wrong, you come down here and look at the base of this plant, you actually have some frass, which is just, you know, feces from the, the borer as it spits it out of that hole. If you peel that away from the, the, the stem, you usually can find there's a hole right there. So this, this insect's boring into the stem. Uh, you usually end up with, you know, more than one in that stem. And then, you know, it just makes this plant where it can't take up the nutrients it needs to. It can't support the, the crop load. You end up with, a lot of times you start ending up with weird shaped zucchini, weird shaped squash. Um, the plant just does not do good and it's not gonna, it's never gonna recover from that kind of, that kind of injury. To uh, prevent it or to kind of control it, you know, you need to put an insecticide down at the base of this plant. Um, but y'all know on a big squash or zucchini plant, Hard to do, hard to get it down to the base. Plus you're worried about killing honeybees and things like that as well. Uh, one good thing with squash and zucchini um, is after about midday, the flowers will actually close up and your, bee, your bees should be out of the field. They're not, going, they're not going to stay in there if they can't get into the flowers. So they should be out of there. And a lot of times a day like this, when we, me and Eli shouldn't be outside, we're sweating to death. You know, we, they, they're probably somewhere cool, staying in the shade. And that's, uh, so you know, you, you're pretty safe to spray then. Uh, and you know, you, but you need to focus your sprays at the, at the base of the plant. One thing I can't show you this year, which I normally could show you every year, is uh, squash bugs. I normally have squash bugs on every plant that I, that I plant in my garden, but for some reason this year, I do not have squash bugs. We'll move on down. We'll, we'll find something else that I'm sure you're seeing in your garden, and we'll talk a little bit about it. All right, this is my. Uh, public service announcement for cleaning out your sprayers. Um, I sprayed a herbicide about a week ago. I rinsed my sprayer out, um, ran what I thought was all of it through the, through the, the line and through the pump and everything, cleaned it out, dumped it out. 
rinsed out again prior to putting an insecticide in it, um, which I, th I thought I rinsed it out really good. Didn't run any kind of soap, no ammonia, no, no nothing uh, through the sprayer. Filled it up with two gallons of water and my insecticide came out here, started on my corn. Hopefully you can see the uh, damage done to the corn. So that just shows you that you, know, you need to make sure you thoroughly clean out your, uh, your garden sprayers between every spray. And especially, not just herbicides, but especially things like insecticides or fungicides, because there might be something that's labeled for corn that's not labeled for something else for a reason. And you might have just a little bit left in it that might leave residues that can be, you know, that can be um, bad for you, your family, or whoever's, you know, eating the vegetables you're producing. One other thing I want to mention is any, once you see silks and once you see these small ears coming out, um, you know, that's the time that you need to start thinking about protecting the corn crop that you're growing from stink bugs and your corn ear worms and things like that. You know, once there's a silk on there, that's an attractant pretty much to that corn ear worm. And uh, once they're, I mean, even an even a ear this small, you could already have stink bug feeding you know, from outside this shuck. They can sit right here and they can puncture through there. And what you'll end up with is you'll end up with an ear that's curved because none of these kernels will develop. Um, so this is the time right now is when you need to be looking in your garden and seeing if you see stink bugs. Looking, you can find the worm eggs sometimes on these, on these silks. Um, or, you know, if you're just one that's going to spray an insecticide anyway, this is the time when you really need to start protecting them. Um, so just a heads up, um, I've already had reports from people of corn earworm, you know, being in corn, uh, sweet corn. And I, I know that uh, in our field corn, stink bugs have been getting, numbers have been getting higher and higher. They're moving out of wheat and they're moving into our corn crop. So, you know, just be on the lookout for those pests as your, you know, as your corn is getting ready. I mean, you've got it to this stage right now, you don't want to lose it now. All right, I don't know if any of y'all, anybody else out there has done it, but I planted some late peas and beans. Um, this is one crop that we can do a really good job controlling weeds in, so I thought I'd touch on that real quick. And there's two things that are actually labeled that we can use um, at this time. I'm actually a little bit late, which I, I hate to show you that I'm, that I'm not doing a very good job weed controlling my garden, but I will. Um, what we got here is I've got some southern peas, and I've got a good number of weeds coming up. I've got a lot of crabgrass. Um, I've got some small um, pig weeds in here. I just stuck a thorn. Um, some small pig weeds, some carpet weed. A lot of these weeds can be, be controlled with one product. A lot of them can be, can be controlled pre-emerge with Treflan. And Treflan or Trifluralin is labeled for peas. Um, I, I don't know the exact rate. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think maybe a pint and a half or a pint per acre. But what you can do is you can put it out and incorporate it, plant your peas. Um, I believe you can also put it out post-emerge as a direct spray, um, as long as you don't have weeds up. Now, if you've got weeds up, Treflan's not going to be any good for you. So some of these weeds here are not going to be controlled by that. But one thing you can do on, on peas um, is you can use um, some post, which will get your, uh, your grass weeds. And you can also use a product called Bassagran, which will get some of your broadleaf weeds, especially if they're small. So I think what I'm going to do here in a little while, after the show's done, is I'll probably end up coming out here with a tiller and till up a lot of these weeds, then spray my Treflan and get it incorporated, and hopefully my next flush of weeds will, will not come back. Because like I said, I've been a little bit behind the eight ball, have not got it out ahead of time, um, so I kind of missed the window. But that is one, that is, this is one crop that we can keep pretty clean with some of the herbicides available for our garden. And lastly, I want to touch on one more thing. Got blackberries over here. And we talked our last episode, I believe, about that spotted wing Drosophila fruit, fruit fly. It's starting to warm up. The traps that I, we talked about in the show, the traps, uh, we're starting to catch more and more of them around in this area. So I would say, you know, now's the time to start really thinking about putting an insecticide on your blackberries. Um, there's about three of them that we can put out. They all have a certain pre-harvest interval, you know, so you can't put them out and go out there and eat the blackberries the same day. Um, I think I think most of them are about three days, maybe one of them seven days. But anyway, there are some products we can use that'll control that that fruit fly. But you know, you don't want to you don't want to put the effort in to getting your blackberry crop to this just to have a fruit fly get in there and, and eat on them. And now you can see some of these blackberries are getting ready. So, um, like I said, a blackberry that once it started turning red, 
is a prime target for that spotted wing Drosophila, the fruit fly, the, the new one that's here. So um, think about protecting these with an insecticide and think about putting uh, some magnesium sulfate or some Epsom salts on your muscadines because everybody should have a pretty decent muscadine crop if they look like all the ones I've seen so far. Um, but yeah, some Epsom salts, one tablespoon per vine will help your, uh, will help your muscadine plants um, get them on to help them mature and get you a good crop. So you have some good snacks later on in the summer while you're, while you're out in the garden. All right. All right, a few episodes ago, I guess probably two now, uh, we talked a little bit about, about bloom thinning and fruit thinning in peaches and how important it was for size and fruit and maturity and things like that. So now we're, we're here in uh, June, July, you know, late summer. We got our good crops of peaches coming in. So I thought I'd show you a good example of what can happen if you do thin versus if you don't thin. Um, we're over here at Fort Valley State University where we have a cooperative with uh, Fort Valley State. We have a, a three acre peach plot. We have three different varieties and we use it to just test out uh, ideas that the growers have in our area and other things, some ideas that we have, you know, for making, you know, for basically making um, peach production more profitable in our area, you know, producing a better peach and, and looking at some different techniques some different cultural practices and seeing if we can improve, you know, peach production right here where peaches are grown. So one of the things we did this year with the cold snap in March, late March, we, you know, we, we had a lot of injury. We didn't know what fruit, what, what blooms were injured. So we said, well, let's not, let's not thin some, some, some limbs let's, and let's thin some limbs and see if we can you know, still size a peach with a, bunch of, with a bunch of flowers or a bunch of blooms or a bunch of small fruit on that limb. And I, if you might remember what I told you is, you know, normal, normal thinning or fruit thinning on most varieties try and leave about six inches between each, each uh, bloom or each fruit. You know, so you'd be looking at about that, about that distance right there. So you can tell, I mean, it's very easy to tell this. You can, I'm sure this is what a lot of your home peach trees look like. You know, you've got a, a limb here with one, two, three, five. You got, you got a limb there with, with about seven or eight peaches right there all within, all within that six inches. Then if you come over here to this limb right here where we properly thinned it, you know, you've got a, a peach here, a peach here. These two, these two normally probably would have been separated and another peach right here. And you can tell pretty easily, these things are about three weeks off, so they've got a lot more time to size up. But these peaches right here are obviously a lot larger than these. A lot of times, these right here, the unthinned fruit, they won't ever, they won't ever mature. Um, if you leave them that thick, if you don't take any blooms off your home orchard trees, you know, whether, whether it's plums, peaches, um, even, even pears, a lot of times those fruit won't ever really reach uh, maturity won't ever ripen up like they need to. And you can tell too, I mean, these are already starting to turn a little red. They're starting to get that red color to them. So uh, like I said, they're, those right there, probably about three weeks off. Uh, hopefully we'll be in here picking before we go to camp. But just wanted to show you kind of what, you know, one, one of the reasons why we say, you know, knock some blooms off, knock some fruit off. You know, you can get a, get a better quality fruit, better size to it. And they're gonna mature a little more evenly. I like to do, I like to try and do timely things on my show. Um, so I thought while we're out here in the peach orchard at Fort Valley State that I would show you all this because I'm sure if anybody has a home garden peach tree, they've seen these little black spots. They may not know what they are. They may have never asked. Anyway, this is peach scab. It's a fungal disease. Uh, the infection actually happens earlier in the year, um, you know, when, during bloom and everything. But the, the fungus just sits on there and, and, and waits and waits and waits. And as it, when the fruit starts to mature, starts to ripen, it starts to show itself. Um, this is just like I said, it's just a fungus. It's not any more than, it's not even, it's no deeper than the, the skin. So these things are fine to eat. Um, it just makes them look a little bit ugly. Can't sell them in the store like this. You can't, uh, can't make up a fancy name for it. But uh, that's peach scab. Like I said, it's a disease, uh, peaches. Doesn't really do much other than, you know, aesthetics. Makes it look a little bit ugly. It brings me to another point though. Um, you know, I like to do timely topics. So if you guys have an idea, if you have something, a question that's going on, something going on in your yard, something going on in your garden, something you want to learn about, you know, y'all email, email your questions, email your, your ideas to, to Flint River Communications. Uh, they'll get me the information and, and I can use that for a show. I, I sometimes have a tough time coming up with ideas to think about for my show. So I, I'm, I'm all, always willing to uh, entertain somebody else's ideas on what, what they want to talk about. So like I said, peach scab, Nothing to worry about. You can eat it. You won't uh, get sick or 
you know, get freckles. So enjoy. All right. Now, if you've ever wondered when you go to a Chinese restaurant why those little tiny ears of corn cost so much, it's because you got to grow a plant this tall to make this little thing right here. <laughs> no, I really just wanted to show you this because um, I think probably like I used to do, a lot of other people do the same thing with corn, sweet corn, or if you're growing field corn in your garden. Um, you know, they wait till corn gets large, gets pretty big, before they start really taking good care of it, putting fertilizer to it and everything. Um, the reason I was showing you this is, I mean, you can't see it yet, but I pulled this ear out of right here. So this next, this next plant over here, about right here or here, you've got an ear leaf and you've got an ear of corn that's already formed. It was formed when this plant was probably about this tall. So when, that, when this plant's this tall, if it goes, undergoes any kind of stress, this ear of corn will be misshapen, it'll be smaller, it won't, you know, will never develop. Um, so when you're, when you're growing corn, which is probably a little late now, but when you're growing corn, you really need to take really good care of that plant from the time it comes out of the ground to the time it's about this tall to make sure you get good ear formation. And then from there on up, you, know, you, wanna, you still wanna make sure you take care of them, have plenty of water, no stresses, and plenty of fertility. Um, another thing to think about is once you get corn, this stuff is about, I unrolled the tassel. This stuff's about to tassel. Uh, probably I'd say in about a week, it'll be tasseling. Uh, maybe two weeks it'll be full tassel. These tassels will, you know, drop pollen um, to pollinate your, your ears. So once you see that, what really once you see that tassel come out and these silks come out of this ear, um, fertilization is really not going to do any good. So you can quit fertilizing, but uh, definitely don't turn off the water. Corn needs probably, you know, you hear different things from different folks, but you're probably looking at at least an inch and a half, maybe two inches of water uh, per week. You know, so you got to supplement rainfall um, once it gets to the silking stage. But anyway, just wanted to show you that, your little baby ear of corn. They are very good to eat, but that's pretty pricey when you got to grow a plant that big to get this little thing right here. Well, as always, I hope some of these things that we discussed today can I kind of help you out and answer a few questions of what's going on in your garden. If not, like I said, you can always send an, uh, a message to the email address at the bottom of the screen. Um, Eli will get me the message and we'll use your, you know, we'll use your question. We might just use your question on the show. We might use your question to do a whole show, you know. I want to do things that will help the viewers, help folks that are watching these shows out. So, you know, if you've got any questions or got some, you know, something you want to, something you want to learn about, just let us know here at uh, Flint River Communication, Local Watch 14. And like we said before, you can follow us on Facebook, you know, like us on Facebook. And you can also um, go to our sorry go to youtube and uh and join our youtube page and you can see all the past episodes of uh, backyard basics and once again thanks for joining us backyard basics where we're filmed here in your backyard